Catherine, we are delighted that we have an official title for you now, Director of Diversity, but of course our partnership has gone on for so long. When did you actually start working with us? Do you remember? Roughly. Date? It was probably close to nearly 14 years ago. I was at the Financial Review writing the Corporate Woman column and I got a call uh, asking me if I'd be interested in coming and speaking at some of the, the symposiums around Australia. That was really interesting and that, that, in fact, I took that up and I did speak at a number of them uh, that year and then in subsequent years did, did more. So yes, it's been a long association. What have you noticed in terms of changes over the time? Look, I think the changes I've noticed have been similar to the changes I noticed during the period I wrote the Corporate Woman column. But I think what I noticed is it moved, uh, the whole sort of debate moved and changed. It became more sophisticated, but it was also about dealing with covert rather than overt discrimination. So uh, in the early days, people would be talking about, you know, being sacked for requesting flexibility or when they announced they were pregnant, uh, you know, classic maternity discrimination. Um, I think we saw less of that. And that's been matched, of course, by more women, slowly but surely, um, moving into the workplace, but also moving up uh, in the workplace. So by no means as many as there should be, but certainly more there. Um, and I think the old excuses about we don't have enough women, we don't have enough experienced women have worn very thin. So I think the focus is on other areas and more about let's diagnose what we can change in the system, the rules and the attitudes that we have to uh, cope with. We were very excited when you launched Stop Fixing Women and you spoke about it at quite a few of our events. I think we even ran panel sessions this year around it as well. What it really stood out though is that focus on what we can do about the system. When we, have, when we run our leadership programs, we still hear from so many women about the challenge around confidence. And from your sage words and the research that you've done, we try not to lean in to talk about fixing that issue but more generally, what, what sort of advice do you give around that? Well, I think we look at this the wrong way around. I think um, lack of confidence has been seen as a cause of women's uh, lack of representation and lack of progress, I think it's a symptom. And often enough, what we're talking about as lack of confidence is coping mechanisms for women in very difficult environments. Um, and I think that once that changes, and again, the research would back this up, um, organisations that have more women in management right up to the top um, have far less problem with getting women to put their hands up for promotions, for example. So once you change the environment, then that confidence seems to magically improve. I really think we've got to stop talking about it as so it's something that they bring um, as a deficit to the workplace and look at it the other way around. It took us to a different place. In 2018, we launched 100 Days for Change, which you know about, and that was an opportunity to create more of a systemic focus and to really encourage organisations and individuals to take on more of a proactive approach. And within that, we heard there was a really strong theme about the language change, that women and men were starting to sort of realise that it wasn't helpful. And I'm keen to hear what you've noticed in terms of the stereotype bias that actually happens is attached to the language, but also the focus on creating a, a, a broader conversation within that space too. What still amazes me, and I think we have wonderful data um, that we capture in Australia through the Workplace Gender Equality Agency. Um, one of the things that their latest um, report has said is that 40% of employers reporting into the agency are now conducting gender pay gap audits um, but only 40% of the 40% are doing anything about it. And I think this is the problem. The rhetoric um, is there, but the action isn't. So I think that, yes, we have a different conversation, and that's very good. Um, we have pockets of activity, which are really welcome, but I don't see the systemic changes. So I think we need to do more in that area and actually make sure that we're aiming for a result and that we're tracking it. Another challenge or uh, focus that we often find comes through our programs is taking away or redirecting some of the conversation from being a, 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 women, a woman's problem. 
that it's only about women. It's women that have to drive it. It's women that have to forge ahead. That it's all about, you know, whether it's the woman or the, the mother often. Um, it's a parenting focus. Do you think it's important to take that focus out totally or do we need to contextualise it? Well, it is annoying when we talk about gender in the workplace and it always ends up by default being a women's issue because men have a gender too, actually. <laughs> and when people say, oh, people should be appointed on merit, not gender, I always say, absolutely right. So why are so many appointments made to men? Uh, because that's a gender issue, right? So, um, but you're quite right. Um, on the other hand, one of the things I hear, I've been hearing a bit more lately, it comes and goes, but I've been hearing in discussions and panels that I've been moderating, um, someone in the audience was saying, you know, we shouldn't talk about gender. It's about diversity of thought or diversity on a broader canvas. Now, I don't think any of those things cancel each other out. I think we can work on all of them and, in fact, all of them benefit. But telling women to go to the back of the queue um, worries me. Um, women make up 51% of the population. If we can't get it right for that many people, well-educated people in our country, then really we've got a problem. So I don't think one is more important than the other, but I do think if we're going to seriously address the homogeneity of particularly the upper ranks of many of our organisations, we do have to talk about gender because there are specifics around sexism and bias um, that are very much about women. One of the, fo the real focus, I suppose, and the, um, the reason why 100 Days for Change became timely for us was because we noticed that there was more conversations around you know, the, the Me Too arena and there was an appetite for change as well, but in perhaps more of a positive direction as well and trying to get the balance. We need to have both yeah. as well. How have you, what, what have you noticed in terms of the Me Too advocacy, the movement, um, and how that has supported or moved us in a direction? What I think it showed was women collectively could uh, have a very affirming experience and change the dynamics. Now, there's no doubt there's been repercussions from the Me Too movement, which are regrettable, um, and there's still much of that to play out, and we're seeing some of that in Australia at the moment. But what I would say is, uh, while the research shows, you know, people are not even aware of Me Too. You know, there's a significant number of people who are, a lot of, who aren't. I can assure you that every employer of a reasonably sized organisation in this country has heard of Me Too. How it's dealt with, of course, is a very different thing. I mean, what we should be looking at now is prevention in the future. But I also have heard from so many women in so many different workplaces that they're being listened to. Uh, it's a shame that it had to be on the back of such appalling um, testimony. Um, but sometimes that's the way change happens. You have a burning platform. The risk from the Me Too mo movement and Me Too allegations is significant. And I think organisations are looking at that. Um, I am really optimistic that in the future it will become less of a, oh goodness, we've got a scandal, and more of a, how can we prevent this in the future? How can we have better gender equity in our workplaces so these things don't happen anymore? Catherine, we've been working with each other for many years through Women in Leadership Australia and it's been such a pleasure. And now we have um, we've formalised it with, this, with the role Director of Diversity. Why now is this important for you to be working with us in this space? I can really sense momentum has been building. Uh, the last series of symposiums were, were really amazing. Um, a huge amount of energy in the room uh, and I think that the work uh, that the organisation's done over the decade and a half that it's been running them um, is really paying off and I can really see the quality of the audiences and the speakers has improved and I think there's a real energy there. And I think the timing uh, on a much broader canvas is fantastic as well. I think, uh, as I say, women are finding their voices through a whole lot of areas. I think the debate's much more sophisticated and I think when women come together to discuss these issues. It improves their lives, but it improves their workplaces and it makes our chances of progress so much greater. So I'm, I'm an optimist about it and I think joining forces means that that momentum will just be greater and continue to flow. And I say watch this space. <laughs> We've got a lot of great work to do together. Thank okay. you so much, Catherine. Thank you. <laughs>